Hello, Galarian. Welcome to Online at Six. This is the podcast where you get to hear a group of nerds cover fun concepts, wacky builds, and interesting Pathfinder 2 rules, mechanics, and subsystems. We'll debate, argue, make terrible puns, and hopefully produce some kick-ass content that will blow your mind. I'm Sabity, a lovely gnome cleric of Desna, reporting live from Nintambu. Today I'm joined by... I'm Green Meadow. Your friendly local immortal Leshy just got finished talking to some of the local pumpkins. Boy, do they have a lot to say. Hi, friend. It's Zephira. I just checked out this great new book, The Game Mastery Guide. Let me tell you, there's some crazy stuff in here. I'm Nock, your local dwarf alchemist, here for whatever you need. And my name's Liam the Lich. Have you heard of Potions of Quicknesses? You need them. You should be using them as early as you can. And they're for sale for only 45 gold. Right over here. Come on in. Come on in. So in this episode, we're going to be talking about alternative approaches. This can mean a lot of things to a lot of people, which you might see as we're talking about this. We're going to just be sharing the things that we've learned that make the game fun for us over the years. Different ways of approaching combats or social situations as a GM and player and see you know, what you know, works for us and what might work for you guys. So to kick us off, I think I'm going to jump right into the point uh, I made right before we started the show, which was approaching the game from the way that makes sense to you and your group. You know, not necessarily the way that you've heard the game is supposed to be played, um, but the way that works for you. And that all kind of starts with a solid foundation. So we talked a little bit about what a session zero looks like and what's important. You have to talk about what you want, but also your your boundaries. You go into a game like Pathfinder and you know there's going to be social encounters, there's going to be combat. Some of them are dungeon crawls. If you know what you want to play and what you like and what you don't like, let your group know. And as a group, I think it's very important to be understanding of what everyone is getting out of the game. Like, I know that role play is very important for Safira. Safira wants a high degree of role play within the game and immersion. I know there are other folks in our group, and I, I put myself in this group, that also value combat. You know, I still love role play and character arcs. Character development is like the reason that I'm into role playing games. But one of the reasons I love Pathfinder 2E is, you know, the combat is great. So we take time to focus on that every so often but it's about putting the needs of your entire party out in the open everyone talking about it having that conversation before you officially start your campaign that's done wonders for us that includes your gm they get to have fun too so include them in those discussions absolutely yeah. Yeah. believe it or not the gm is a player too so it's important for everybody to have gm are people too they are humanoids too what are some things that we've discussed before we started? I think session zeros are incredibly important, but I don't know if we've ever actually had like a true session zero. I think we're one of those unique groups where we're just like a fringe group first and we happen to all be interested in playing this game. But if you're playing with a bunch of strangers or people that you don't really know that well, session zeros are incredibly important. The things that we've talked about kind of over time as we're preparing for an adventure is you know what we really want out of it. We actually were playing Strength of Thousands now. That was not our plan. You know, we were planning on playing Agents of Edgewatch. I had prepared to, I bought all the books, was prepared to buy the Absalom book. It got delayed because I wanted the Absalom book before you actually playing. And we were sitting in a bar eating food and talking about Strength of Thousands because the player's guide had just come out. And everyone was like, can we play that instead? So here we are. And so like having that, you know, ability and knowledge of your group and just rolling with it and, you know, being okay with rolling with the punches and listening to what your players actually want to play and what they want to do is really important. I think this is the best AP for our group because it's got both role play and combat, but that might not be the case for you guys. And so some APs are like Green Meadow was saying, more dungeon crawly, and that might be good for you. But that conversation is super important. Strength of Thousands as a whole, I would say, is an alternate approach. Playing through this has been so fun because it's 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 almost like playing another game or like playing a game that I'm just so familiar with that feels like home just in a different way because it is very social interaction based. Um, there's a lot of different smaller systems that are developed into it. Like the Academy subsystem, I think really helps, uh, you know, split things up so that it's not entirely role play that you're doing. You are still falling back on some mechanics, but you're enjoying the game in a different kind of modus operandi where we'll throw on a we have a combat every so often but you know we've done excellent in those so far it's been a lot of fun but yeah just a little bit hypocritical here in that to kind of prepare for your session zero 
If there, you're playing a published AP and there's a player's guide, you might want to read it because it's going to tell you what you can expect from the AP. And Please read the player's guide, Liam. I do not know what you're talking about. I've read every player's guide twice all the way through. <laughs> I just don't remember it afterwards. <laughs> uh, there it is. You know, I think that that's kind of a, a funny point. I think another just sort of funny thing that our group does as we're like getting ready for an AP is for the most part, we don't actually talk to each other about who we're going to play or, you know, MMOs have really, I think, given us all this mindset that there are sort of set roles within a party that, you know, one person's meant to be a tank, one person is, you know, meant to deal damage, but then, you know, they go down easier. They're supposed to be a healer and a cleric. One thing that I love about our group is we, we really don't ever talk about that. And I think it's one of kind of the strengths of the Pathfinder system that truly, just believe me on this one, you don't need tanks and healers. Like don't eat those role, those set roles don't exist in this system. So right you guys now- you have a healer right now. No, yeah, not, no, no, no. Not, not really. We got some people that have like a little bit of healing. Uh, our two sort of most high armor, high hit point, both prefer to fight at range. So we've got, we've got more like ranged tanks if that was like really a thing. Yeah, you could have an entire party of rogues and completely succeed. You would have to approach combat differently, but you can absolutely succeed with an, a party of all rogues, all investigators, all anything. Yeah, I think that's the thing is like, yes, you will have to approach things differently, but the system allows you to approach things differently. Yes. Exactly. You don't have to have all of these roles filled because you can talk your way out of combat. You can find a different way to approach things. Maybe you're all more tanky and more built to fight and then you're playing an AP like Strength of Thousands. You can figure it out and it can still be fun. You also don't necessarily have to build characters that you think would fit into the AP. Yeah, I, I mean, we have a character right now who is a superstition barbarian in Strength of Thousands who hates magic. And it works so well. And, you know, I was a little nervous going into the AP of, like, how we're going to work this out, how we're going to make sure that this character can play, the, you know, be who they want to be, an adventure full of magic. And I think it's created some fantastic moments, to be honest. I would just like to note, a lot of this leads to is shenanigans. And just to at least thanks everybody for rolling with our shenanigans, but it can be very, very fun to just do something crazy and be a little weird. I mean, it's the importance of talking to your GM. Like, you can do all the shenanigans you want as long as you've talked to me. It's when you do shenanigans and you don't talk to your GM and, you know, they're not aware of what you're planning on doing that things can kind of fall apart quickly. Absolutely. As a very chaotic player myself, I, even I recognize that it's not about making everything unhinged. Talk with your GM first and then do that chaos. That'll, that will not only be a fun time for everyone or, or help guarantee that, but also allow your party and your GM to better tell this chaotic story that you want to weave. I think it's great that we don't really talk about our specific characters with each other when we're creating, you know, our characters, you know, at home and, ooh, I think they should have this backstory. But when we get together, we riff off of each other very well and we still create our characters together in that sense. Like when we played Age of Ashes, you know, we went into session one and I, we decided that I was going to be, you know, um, a grandma. And then who is going to be my grandson? The player right next to me. And then we develop like a whole relationship together. And, you know, in this game, Strength of Thousands, I'm Luna. You know, I derive power from celestial stuff. And then we just happen to have a character named Soul. We're complete opposites. It's been a ton of fun. And we just are able to riff off of each other and work together in situations that, you know, if we had tried to create the perfect party, we probably wouldn't have those shenanigans. So we were talking a bit about how you can succeed with any party makeup. And I think on that note, it's a really good way to spring forward uh, onto the topic of optimization, which is something that comes up really frequently within this community. Um, All those min-maxers. A lot of min-maxers. There are some things that if you are going to be a combat 
focused character. Yes, you probably need a plus three or a plus four in your main stat. And yes, you will probably struggle without that. I, I think that's important to acknowledge. But that aside, you can be successful with a character that is optimized, unoptimized, has a very focused stat array or a very random stat array. The system is built around that. And the reason for that, which I, I want to see more people talk about, I feel like, is that every stat is linked to so many different aspects of the game, right? So when you're choosing your stats, if you're giving up the ability to, let's say, you know, you, you decrease your strength so that you're not doing as much damage in combat, sure, but if you instead put that in a charisma, now you can intimidate, now you can scare the other enemies, induce that frightened condition, deal more damage, that's all really important. And there's so many different ways to approach the game too. When you're building your character, you don't need to be thinking about just combat. You can be thinking about what feats can I take that will make the role-playing experience of my character better because there are so many of them. They often get overlooked because people are more focused on the combat and on optimization. There's a lot of feats out there that will help you better enjoy your character if you're brave enough to take them. Our rules layer has often given me the side eye for not maxing out my best stats. <laughs> What's your that's not, that's not your DC. Oh wait, your dex is two? Oh, well I guess that's I guess easy. that's right then. I guess. <laughs> oh yes, I have incurred the, not wrath, the silent resentment of our <laughs> rules lawyer. But he lets me still play my character how I want, even an alchemist, which isn't that optimized anyways. But I still had a ton of fun, and I think our party had a lot of fun too. And, and you made or break many battles yeah. when you were playing as the alchemist, even, even though, though I you, wasn't optimized. Your two hit was not good. Let's be honest, it was not great. But when you did, you would have huge implications on the fight. Don't need but, to hit when you have splash damage. Yes. yes, even though I couldn't hit a lot because I was an alchemist, I could still hit when I mixed. So. I was able to approach my character a little bit differently in combat so that it's like, okay, maybe I can't hit very well, but after combat, I can fix everybody's shield in a minute because I have a fantastic crafting check. Or I can do something else. I can make all of the bombs and give them out to everybody. I can heal everybody, but maybe not hit, but still give four damage. That's fine. But they're weak to fire and that four damage turns into 24 damage and suddenly things are different even when you miss. We are remember. a pro alchemist party We are here. a pro alchemist Alchemists party. are objectively not fun. Objectively <laughs> not fun. <laughs> I, I learned that opinion listen. on Reddit, so it has to be true, people. <laughs> I read it, I read it on Reddit. I remember a moment where uh, Nock was actually playing two characters, <laughs> but Nock's uh, uncle, Rorsk, um, which is a name some of you might recognize, but Nox's uncle Rorsk was a cleric in our game. And uh, he decided to make some holy water for Nox to throw. And it ended up creating this incredible like dynamic of Rorsk makes the holy water and Nox throws it uh, in this combat that otherwise Nox would have been useless, frankly, because all the enemies that everyone was going against were immune to basically everything Nock could do. But by working together and having these two characters use their abilities in a unique way that we hadn't really thought about before, it ended up creating this incredible combat that turned around and went away I certainly wasn't expecting. So while we're talking about alternate approaches, I think that's an excellent segue into rewarding player creativity, both inside and outside of combat. Yes, the rules are very structured, and yes, that helps us better play the game. But there are certainly times, and Sabine, maybe you would be able to speak on this a little better, when a situation arises that the rules just aren't there for, but you really want to give the player some sort of reward. And I strongly encourage everyone listening to do exactly that. Whether it's a social encounter where the player themselves says just the right thing, maybe you drastically lower the DC of a check, or maybe in a combat, you do something that is so flavorful and so gosh darn cool that they get a plus two or three to that, to the roll. Um, these kind of things really enhance the, the flavor and the fun of our games. And I, I can't encourage it enough. That's how it became immortal. Oh yeah. I mean, for Green Meadow, Green Meadow is actually immortal 
we we say that at the top of every episode but in our canon green meadow is immortal um and the reason behind that is because green meadow died and uh green meadow's player brought back another leshy and another leshy <laughs> and uh we thought it was funny that it was just this same leshy that kept coming back you know by the rules of leshies it's supposed to take time and you're supposed to be made by a druid and all of this stuff but it made so much more sense for our game for Leshies just to come back. A similar thing happened with another character who came back named Vasha, died in his first session <laughs> and it was rough. We ended up bringing him back a few books later as a Duskwalker with the returned background because it made so much sense. Saf, you can talk more about this. Uh, you wanted to play this character and it sucked for him to die so quickly. And just on the on the note of alternative approaches, in that first session, Vasho was one one higher on my diplomacy check, and he wouldn't have died. So yep. diplomacy is important, guys. <laughs> almost talked my way out of the fight, but you know, you know that, that plus one strength is important, but you know that plus one uh, charisma sometimes is even more important. You can't die in a fight if it doesn't start. And then lastly, as an example, they always seem to come back to Nock. I think it's because he's an alchemist and it has to play the game a little differently. I think alchemists are made for this, but Nock actually used a crystal bomb while being swallowed by a creature. By the rules, it wouldn't have probably really done anything, but we decided that by throwing that crystal bomb, you know, it made shards in this uh, creature's throat that would allow Nock to actually climb out of the throat rather than having to break out because you know, Nox and Alchemist, they're not going to reach that uh, rupture threshold that other characters might be able to reach because most of the time he's doing splash damage. And so as an alternative, in order to not have Nox die from being swallowed, we worked together as a group to say, you know what, I think this makes sense. Since in this moment, Nox can throw this, this crystal shard bomb create a basically ladder out of this creature and you use athletics or acrobatics uh, to get out. And I'm sure a lot of people listening might say, might worry that by doing something like that, we forever altered the rules. And I, I just want to say that's not been the case. I, we all understand very well as a group that every situation is different. Like from this point on, we don't go, now if you get swallowed, you can use crystal shards to climb out of a creature's mouth. That's not how it works. It was in that specific situation. It made a lot of sense to what Zoe ran with it. Don't be afraid to experiment and do something wacky. And for GMs out there, don't be afraid to say, I'm allowing this once and never again, maybe, but yeah, that's awesome. Let's do it once. Yeah, I, that's a fear I had. I know coming into GMing Pathfinder 2, we played 5e before, um, which is much less rules heavy. And so I was really, you know, kind of a stickler to the rules early on in our playing, just because I was worried about breaking the system. I didn't have that system mastery yet. So I was kind of overly scared of breaking it. But I think you guys taught me that it's okay to just say this once, yes, maybe not later. And, you know, we roll with that idea and it works so much, creates amazing moments. And then I can trust my players to say, we're not going to take advantage of this later because it makes sense now and it's cool now, but it will be not so cool when we're taking advantage of it to break combats. Yeah, the game is so much better when the party as a whole understands that they're not going to purposefully ruin the game for everyone. And that sounds like an obvious thing like that I shouldn't have to say, but I just see so often complaints about this or GMs that are worried or stressed out because they're afraid they're going to set the precedent for something. If your group understands that the game itself will evolve, then th despite these small gamifications we, we make within the system, we can still use those very specific moments to adapt and evolve the system as we're playing. Mm -hmm. To be fair, I think a lot of that also is just sort of the legacy of Pathfinder 1, which definitely rewards system mastery and understanding that there are some feats that are just ridiculously powerful and some builds that are ridiculously powerful and those characters tend to really sort of dominate a table. And there are some feats in that that are just simply not as effective. Pathfinder 2 is a really, really well-tuned really finely tuned sort of rule system and machine where the math is tight the math is tight the math is clean yeah absolutely where it, you hear it's the math a lot now it's a cliche almost but that math is tight. It's true the math's tight. <laughs> yeah so for gms that are worried kind of about that because of any experience they might have had with pathfinder one or things that they might have read about pathfinder one really not the case in this system 
very hard to completely break um, the system. As our rules lawyer likes to say, you don't know a system until you've broken it. Much harder to do in this. So you can definitely feel free to, you know, have fun with it. Something that Sabadi brought up is when she allowed things like not climbing out with the shards, you can tack some rules onto it, like that athletics check or that acrobatics yes. check. You don't have to just you're like, oh, that sounds fun. It all just happens. It's like, okay, well, that might happen, but you have to make this check or you have to do this or use this. It doesn't have to just be. Yeah, there's always another way, another skill, another something that you can use that keeps that challenge there, but makes it more interesting. Online, once I saw, and this always stuck with me, and I don't know if we've done it, but I would love to. I love the idea of uh, using a hero point to do something above and beyond, right? So, what's a hero wanna, point? Ah, well, a hero points are something players are given once every hour by the rules. Mm. However, <laughs> we don't play by the rules here, we hate the rules. So, instead, we do one per session, <laughs> but but no. The idea is that you can use a hero point to bend the rules, change things around, or do something a little out of the ordinary than you normally would. I think giving up hero point in exchange for that is another excellent way to kind of stick with the system to a higher degree, but still have a cost associated with players doing something a little out of the normal. So for anyone that's very system oriented, consider that as a possible option. As we're talking about combat, there are a lot of alternate ways to approach combat, whether we're doing it or even not doing it. So we've had plenty of times within our own gameplay where I think we've avoided what would traditionally have probably led to combat through uh, social interactions or we've approached combat from a different way. Um, Sabade, as you're kind of looking back at your experience GMing us, does any point stand out to you in terms of uh, a moment where maybe we would have had combat, but because something was done, instead we approached the game differently? Um, yeah, there's a there's a few times that I can think of. Um, I think something that I've tried to talk about with you guys, and you guys are really good about, is just because we roll initiative doesn't mean a combat has started. Yes, mm. rolling initiative could mean that you're going to have a social encounter, and so it just means that we're slow in the down a bit. We're going to take things moment by moment, give everybody their chance to say what they're doing, get into position if combat does break out, but it does not mean an attack. You guys are really good about when we do that, talking to each other. And I think I give you the space to talk to each other, being like, is this person a threat right now? Are we attacking them? Or are we you playing things by ear? Recently, you guys have had more opportunities for that. I think it's hard to think back early days of Age of Ashes. You guys definitely had moments, but as you got further into the campaign, obviously things got a little more high stakes and it's harder at higher levels to uh, talk your way out of combat. But at low levels, there's been times so far in Strength of Thousands where you've brought other NPCs to situations where you create a more comfortable front for people. And rather than immediately being a threat, you're now somebody that they can talk to. When I think about times we've approached combat alternatively, actually one in Age of Ashes that uh, really comes to mind, and, you know, to keep the spoilers fairly minimal, we had to infiltrate a slave auction. Sabody, you told us kind of going into it, like, trust me, this is one of those times where maybe you don't want to think about killing every single potential enemy you see because there's going to be a lot and they're going to be really, really powerful. So we really had to think about other ways to sort of get around this. And by using a combination of our more infiltration based characters, we were able to get into the party. But what I thought was actually really, really interesting is that we had one one player character uh, who had Tiller, so the, the Bellflower Network background and dedication so it's just for those who don't know the lore as well it's this super anti-slaving organization that spread throughout galarian and we had completed another mission earlier where we had actually liberated a group of abolitionists essentially and by doing those two things completing the one quest that we didn't know was going to lead to us freeing these abolitionists and our players background as this hardcore abolitionist we were able to actually utilize them as a distraction to escape which then ended up negating all of the combat that we would have had when our infiltrators rolled low and you know that one's on me you know my dice were just really bad that day again i don't think anybody would say that the the tiller that you know the bellflower operative you know background dedication is overpowered but in this one case 
got us out of a very, very sticky situation. Yeah, I think that can be fun is bringing in these narrative background things that would never come up and being able to bring them in and you have them make some sense narratively. One other way, as we're looking at alternative ways to do things, I immediately think of spells, uh, specifically cantrips, doing cantrips for flavor. This is something we started very recently to do. If you have produced flame and your character wants to just light something on fire and it's not gonna hugely impact the implications of the game, just do it. If you want a ray of frost, something to cool it down, yes, mechanically the game doesn't say that you can do that, but it would make sense within the world, we think. Have that conversation with your crew to make sure that's something everyone's comfortable with, I would say for sure. But that said, ever since we started introducing just flavor spells and, and calling it out before you do it, like, can I do a flavor spell here? My character can do a mirror image. And I think it would be so funny if there were two of my characters standing here, but I don't necessarily want to burn a spell slot. GMs, try it out. Just, just give it a go and see if it works because we've had a lot of fun integrating that into our games. And I, I really recommend it for anyone listening. And what we're talking about here too is uh, in a roundabout way, exploration uh, versus encounter. And I think we've gotten a lot of mileage from just literally as a group being like, okay, we are turning now from exploration mode to encounter mode. That doesn't mean a fight's happening. That doesn't mean everyone needs to draw the weapons. It just means now's the time we get a little more granular with the rules. And that is something Pathfinder does very well, but doesn't always do an excellent job explaining itself about, right? So it's very important to understand, there, we could do a whole episode on this, but what time looks like within Pathfinder, right? So it's the GM as well as the party's responsibility to understand if something needs to be very granular on a time basis, maybe move it to encounter mode and do it in a turn-based um, system. There are if times where you guys have asked to roll for initiative where you're like can we roll for initiative right now and i think that's something that a player should be able to do to a gm be like i need things to be moment by moment right now and on the flip side of that there have been plenty of times where we've saved ourselves so much time by just being like hey i don't know if this needs to be an encounter anymore can we move to exploration mode again you know you, you finished up the combat there's one enemy remaining he's begging for his life and you go yeah sure we're gonna let you live Ask your group, or if you were the GM, say to the group, you know what, I think this would be an excellent time to move back uh, into exploration mode and just treat the game from that lens, which the system, the mechanics provide, which is a different way to look at the game, a different way to play, and a way to encourage more RP at certain times and more combat at certain times. So really, my biggest advice for anyone that's listening is, think about when you want encounter versus exploration mode and which mode best fits what you're doing in the moment you're playing. Yeah, I think that's something that comes with experience with the system as well. I remember early on, we were very bad at that. <laughs> uh, me in particular, I was very bad at that. In you know, looking at specific rules that take time to resolve. I remember a specific situation where uh, we had a character that was bleeding out. It wasn't a life or death kind of situation, but we spent like a good 10 yep. minutes rolling, you know, to stop that <laughs> minute by everyone, minute. <laughs> yeah, everyone was rolling garbage. And I thought it was going to be this thing that would resolve super quickly. And then it just turned into this thing. And it almost became a joke at that point of like, nope, we're not letting go now. We are rolling this out. <laughs> but now I would never do that. <laughs> like, usually, if somebody's taking persistent damage at the end of a combat, I look at their health, look at where they're at, where they are in like the world itself and go, is this something that could kill them? And if it's something that could kill them, yeah, we're rolling it out. But if it's something that it's not and they're in a position where they can get themselves safe and they don't have to worry about, you know, it being life or death, then we go, okay, so we're going to go back into exploration. Assume that you guys resolved that and you have the potions to do so. Spend a couple potions. That's fine. And you'll be good to go. And so, yeah, playing in those modes of play, which I think we'll get into in future episodes a lot, actually. But playing in those modes of play is really important. I hear a lot of sometimes complaints about, like, exploration mode uh, not being, like, anything. And that that's the main mode of play that you play in. Yes. But, like, knowing how to move between the different modes of play is really important and something that comes with experience. All right, I think that's going to be everything 
for this episode. I think we've touched on a lot of points, but there is a lot still to talk about. And I'm sure that there's a lot that everyone listening has experienced in their own games that they would call an alternative approach. So let us know what your alternative approaches are, what's worked for your group. Leave a comment, make sure to like and subscribe and turn on that notification setting. Thank you guys for joining us. This has been Online at Six.